Hello, I'm Dr. Basil Considine. I'm here from the ACU Online Writing Center, and today we're going to be talking about vectors and film analysis. Not vectors in the physics sense so much as vectors showing the directions that things evolve, that things develop. And so this is something that, although the particular assignment that we'll be looking at pertains to the higher education program, it is something that if you are at all working in student services, in uh, educational leadership, or several related fields, you might want to be watching this one as well. So because of where we are in the semester, we're just going to dive straight into talking about this uh, particular topic with one note saying that if you are in the higher education program, do be aware that we have this tabbed guide on our webinars page. Just scroll down past the schedule and you'll find that if you click on HIED, you will see a up-to-date list of all the courses that we have webinar tie-ins with for your program. This is a list that expands throughout the term, so as soon as we offer a webinar that ties in, we add it to this listing as well, so you can always check back and find the latest greatest. And because we time our webinars so that they're normally released in the first day or two of each academic week, by the time that uh, you're working on stuff, very likely we will have a webinar coming out that same day, or if not earlier. So with that little note, let us dive right into our material here, because we've got a bit to talk about. So we're going to start with a review of Chickering and Reiser's Seven Vectors of Identity Development. And we're going to review those before we talk specifically about the Higher Education 613, Week 3, Assignment 4, I Spy the Vectors, where you do a film analysis using these vectors, using the film as a sort of case study a, where you're using it to illustrate the principles of the vectors to show how these things manifest and to demonstrate your understanding of those. We'll finish that portion by talking about some key sources that you'll be using and citing as part of that assignment and finish with the normal outlining and drafting as we talk through how to translate the instructions into a guide for how to outline your paper. So let's talk about those seven vectors. Now, most people at this point in their studies are familiar with the seven vectors, usually the form described in Turking and Reiser's 1993 book, Education and Identity. Uh, that is, by the way, Education and Identity, second edition. Why is that distinction important? Well, because the first edition was written uh, about 24 years before that, and uh, there's been quite a lot that's changed in terms of knowledge and understanding, and particularly of the how the seven developmental vectors work in a generalized sense in the intervening period. So the first version of this text was written by Chickering in the 60s, and the, the 1993 one that you'll usually be seeing cited is describing an updated, expanded, and refined version. So the seven vectors enumerated in this source are number one, developing competence, number two, managing emotions, number three, moving towards, sorry, moving through autonomy toward interdependence, number four, developing mature interpersonal relationships, number five, establishing identity, Number six, developing purpose. And seven, developing integrity. Now, these seven vectors were laid out in Chickering's original text, but what exactly they mean and the understanding of how they relate has shifted a bit. So make sure that you are citing the version that you're actually using, because there have been some fairly substantial changes over the years. And with that, Understanding how the vectors are being used and how to apply them, how to glean insight, it's very helpful to understand a little bit about what they were produced for, or what was the need that led to them being articulated and discerned, uh, what was going on in society that people wanted to understand, and you know, these are researchers working in the United States. So in 1968, we see 
Eric Erickson publishing his book called Identity, Youth, and Crisis. And this is a series of essays on various topics, including adolescent development. And in several of the essays, Erickson comments on social events in U.S. society, of which there are some developments that uh, really were new developments in uh, U.S. society. The mass protests of the civil rights movement, the mass protests against the Vietnam War, and other topics as well. And so he was seeing this rise and big changes in how youth were acting, especially uh, reacting to authority and changing gender roles, and wrote his book, among other things, to try and explain what was going on. And so as part of that, he developed this idea that he articulated as the adolescent identity crisis. And without going too far into that, he sees adolescence as a transitional period, not a stage where you get and you, you stay there, um, but that it's this place where you're in flux. You're not no longer a youth and you're not really an adult. And that there's a lot of stuff that affects how people react at that age to the situations around them that is because of this crisis of trying to figure out who they are or having that actively changing as they go through adolescence. Now, with that idea, uh, because there are earlier examples that, oh, you're a man at 13, say, uh, this idea that there's this ongoing development and that perhaps educators and people who work in education, in higher education, should be taking that into account and working to nurture that, that thing that comes out of the conceptualization of the adolescence as a transition, that feeds into Arthur Chickering's book that comes out the next year, where he describes seven vectors of development as a sequential process. Oh, okay, we know people are, their identity is changing as they move from adolescence into adulthood. And so he laid out, okay, here are these seven things that go on, and they happen in order. Now, there are a couple things that are very helpful to keep in mind. Uh, Chickering's research, Chickering's original research, was working with a small group of traditional students at a small liberal arts college. Now, whenever you have a homogeneous group, there's the question of, can these results be generalized to the broader population? And back then, to a large extent, they might have for other small liberal arts colleges. We used to have a whole lot more in this country, but things were changing. There were a lot more students who were going to school in the 60s, 70s, and into the 80s. There were a lot of students from different educational backgrounds, from different regions, uh, new immigrants, uh, people of races and ethnic groups that had been traditionally either uh, excluded or primarily enrolled in historically serving institutions like the HBCUs. And so they realized, oh, you know what? <laughs> this is was working well for that particular population, but it's not applying quite in that fashion when we look at these other students who are also coming in and enrolling and going through college and their higher education. And so in 1993, a Arthur Chickering and Linda Reiser work on an updated version of the education identity textbook that comes out. And one of the things they do is they refine the theory. And I, I do want to emphasize that theories usually are refined and go through multiple revisions as they're applied to different situations and say, oh, in this circumstance that, or this thing is actually more important, or this is other key element that we didn't pay attention to. And so in this case, they're looking back over more than two decades where there's huge changes in American society, and also a lot of findings about student psychology, sociology, and other things. And so one of the things they realize is that, oh, yeah, this isn't necessarily a sequential linear process where you go from one to two and then to three and then to four and then to five all the way through the end. Instead, they 
came up with a revised conceptualization, something like this, that you have several stages that are happening at the same time as part of working towards establishing who you are. And once you have established that identity, then you start working on developing purpose and integrity. And, you know, not every student will follow this particular progression either, and there might be some going back and forth in between them before you progress to another stage, as it were. So a lot of the literature about the seven vectors since that original publication has been, well, we looked at it in this circumstance, and this is what we found, <laughs> or this is what people reported, and so for this group, these things were happening at this time, and then these, and then some people went back and had to rework on their managing emotions after they established identity other things like that. Now, for the assignment that you'll be looking at if you're in the higher education class, they do invite you to enlist outside literature. And so that is a very useful thing to do to look and see, okay, how does that align with the particular group that you're trying to analyze? Because although Erickson was working on adolescence, Chickering was working on college students. And although these were developed, these seven vectors were developed originally for college students, they are and have been applied in different contexts as well, sometimes with more fit, sometimes with less, sometimes with more modifications, sometimes with less. So with that, let's look at some uh, expansion of these vectors, because it's not just developing confidence generally, but specifically looking at how you're defining competence, intellectual, physical, manual, like working with your hands, being reflexes and stuff like that, being able to catch an object, hand-eye coordination, interpersonal, very related, and one of the reasons that in the original conception it was thought of more linear, uh, managing emotions is our second vector. Now, are you aware <laughs> of what's going on? How are you feeling? How are you accepting this? Or are you trying to ignore or suppress that? And then moving through this autonomous phase where you don't want help to realizing that there are things that you do need other people and that you know, might want to be nice to them and things like that. So we have this combination of self-sufficiency and self-direction as different ways of understanding what, uh, what you're learning about how to be autonomous, and then also uh, maybe it's not a good idea to be autonomous in that. You can be too self-sufficient to the point of causing problems. Uh, there's a economic policy called autarky, where you try and make your country, your region, totally independent. And it's usually very inefficient, because, for example, if you're trying to grow vegetables in Alaska, it's not that it's impossible but it's not the easiest, and it's not nearly as productive as, say, growing vegetables in Florida. <laughs> so, uh, there are many shadings here, and some of them involve going back and forth as uh, independence in one direction comes at the cost of another. And then we have developing mature interpersonal relationships. Notice the mature part. If we're talking about... Uh, adolescence, uh, I think a lot of people would say that, well, yes, there are relationships there, but they're not necessarily what we call mature, uh, mature adult yet. And uh, part of that, we have the developing a tolerance and appreciation of differences between people and a capacity for intimacy, uh, compassion, and other things like that. Vector number five, well, <laughs> you can see there's a lot of bullets here, and this is one of the reasons that the revised conception of these has establishing identity as this big goal that several different things are contributing towards that perhaps working on all of these before you discern that. So here we have things like having comfort with your body and your appearance, with your gender identity and your sexual orientation, uh, sense of self, Define many different ways. Clarification of you know how you see or understand yourself through the things you do and how you do them. 
uh, how your sense of self is harmed or not in response to feedback from other people that you care about. What's your self-acceptance and self-esteem like? And uh, your, your personal stability and how you integrate everything together to have that consistency, that structure, that comfort. Now, these are multifaceted, and some of them may be attacked or diminished by developments in these. You now, you start a new job, and then you discover, oh, uh, I actually need to develop these new intellectual competencies. I don't feel as self-confident anymore. And that may threaten the identity that you thought you had firmly established because circumstances have changed. And that's one of the interesting ways that this is being applied in the literature to look at how when people go through different settings, how their confidence and sense of security are affected. In vector six, we have developing purpose, where it can be things like developing a plan for your career and other things that you do, your vocations, you know, your aspirations and goals. What What is it you want to do and how do you find meaning there? What are your personal interests versus your professional ones or, you know, what other people have been telling you to do? Uh, what are your interpersonal and family commitments that you've developed? Uh, parenting is a classic example of people having children and finding that their approach to life changes very substantially. And parenting isn't just parenting your children. Sometimes it's taking on a caretaker role for your own parents as they get older, or for other people in your life who end up needing that assistance. And then we get developing integrity, where we have a lot of values that you might be crystallizing or figuring out how to enact them in practice. And this is something that's also potentially influenced by the context that you're in. You move to a new context, things are different. I'll give you an example here. Um, as a Fulbright scholar, I worked in Madagascar. Madagascar, at the time, fourth poorest country in the world. There's a lot of poverty everywhere. Now, in the United States, in a major city, if I was to say, mm. fill my pocket with dollar bills, and then give one away to every person I met along the way who was visibly homeless or uh, soliciting, I could do that and still have dollar bills in my pocket at the end. If I did that in here in Madagascar, because there's so much poverty, I would run out pretty quickly. Like, I, some days I wouldn't get more than like 10 minutes walk from my apartment before I would be out. And what do you do in a situation like that? And that, that's the kind of thing where a lot of the research that has come out shows, oh, change something and you might have to go back and look at, well, hold on. <laughs> How are you redefining your identity? If you're not used to seeing yourself as rich, then you go to a place where, through almost every measure, you are quite rich compared to the average person. You know, what does that do to your sense of, uh, well, to take the third bullet here, the sense of self in your cultural context, in your social context? And what does that do when you're living in another place and you look different from everyone else? And uh, don't have to... Uh, Say that uh, when you're in a country like Madagascar, if you are Caucasian or part Caucasian, you will be very visibly standing out, and uh, actually uh, people will point that out to you all the time. And how you come to terms with this identity, what you see your refined identity in this context, that's going to be something that could involve revisiting some of these other things. So, with that, let us turn to look at the Higher Education 613 course at the week three, assignment number four, the I Spy the Vectors. So this is coming from Introduction to Student Services. But as I mentioned earlier, this is actually a topic that is very, very, very important for working in all sorts of education and higher education areas and in human resources as well. Because if you understand what people are going through, it's a lot easier to figure out how to work with them effectively. But, as I say, it's complicated. 
So this assignment begins with a preamble, a summary. All right, in this assignment, you're to watch the movie Finding Nemo for the specific purpose of identifying Chickering and Riser's seven vectors in one or more or of the movie characters. You are able to use other sources outside the textbook, but make sure that they're scholarly publications. So someone's blog, not so much. A journal article, yes. And there is a related group discussion where you're able to develop these ideas. So make sure that you start posting it in that group first. Don't wait till the end. And that will give you a set of ideas and insights that you can draw on. But before you post that, I recommend that you outline your paper because then you'll see what kinds of things you need. And so if people have posted a bunch of ideas already covering some of those, well, look at the things that haven't been covered yet. So you'll work in a group discussion to compare or contrast your insights from the movie, and then you'll write an individual response paper to identify all the vectors in one or more of the movie's characters. Uh, I would recommend as you watch the movie that you keep notes and track the vectors that you spot in different characters because you might see some of them in one character, but the goal is to have all of them in in uh, your analysis, so that might involve tracking more than one character. So if you just take notes as you go, you'll be better able to write this at the end rather than, oh shoot, I only found three of those for this character. I need to watch it again. <laughs> All right, so moving through into the assignment and main instructions. So we have a synopsis of the movie. Uh, we'll pass over that because you've probably heard or seen the movie, and at any rate, you're going to be watching the movie. <laughs> and let's move towards the detailed description. View the movie for the purpose of identifying Chickering and Reiser's seven vectors in the movie's characters. You may choose one character and demonstrate how they exhibit all seven vectors. For example, you select Nemo and then demonstrate how they exhibit one, two, three, all the way through seven. Alternately, you may work through the seven vectors by choosing a vector and then identifying a character that exhibits that specific one. And this is why I was recommending that you just start taking notes as you go. If you've got the list of seven vectors in front of you, like, oh, this character did that, this one did that. And you might find a through line where you say, okay, th this character has all seven, but you might find that you have more examples if you're drawing from the different ones. So just take notes as you go. And then when you're sure that you have a list to be able to do all seven, then you're ready to write. All right, so reminder in this last bullet point, uh, whatever approach you take, make sure you identify each of the vectors by name and explain how a particular character portrayed that vector. So we've got the two contrasting approaches, one character with all seven vectors, or a, uh, a grab bag of whichever characters you want that you can find supporting examples to illustrate each of the seven vectors. So besides the, the parallel discussion on the discussion board to tease out some of these ideas, you need to write an individual paper using these provided prompts as the, the guiding principle. So with that, we see there's a breakdown. Okay, you need an introduction. And then to go through in order, one paragraph for vector, all seven vectors. Now I, I'm going to say there are a number of resources out there and follow-up things, you know, explorations of this concept that will rearrange some of these. So make sure you're following the order here, the order from Chickering and Racer 1993, so that it's consistent and you don't lose any credit for misnumbering them. So this is the seven vectors as articulated in that source and you know read through the lens of the course textbook. So we have the introduction. We've got this paragraph each for the seven vectors. And then a concluding paragraph where you're told to summarize things and reflect on how identifying the vectors in the Nemo characters will be useful in your work with college students. Uh, what are some ways these vectors can be useful in working with students? So examples would be good. And this is, some papers have a shorter conclusion. This is probably going to be a longer one. Uh, if it spills into two 
paragraphs, you know, if it reads clearer, that's usually not a problem. But uh, make sure that you don't just uh, say, oh, oh, wait, yeah, I will think about it when I meet with students. That's a bit too general. We want more detail than that. Especially since this is going to be a 12 to, five, uh, 12 to 1500 word paper, which works out to roughly five to six double spaced pages, not counting the title page or references. And like everything else in the program, this should be formatted with citations in APA style, acknowledge all your sources. And we, if we look at the rubric for this assignment, we see that the, we have uh, some general guidelines. So 50% of the points are, okay, did you write everything that we were asked? <laughs> and is the writing of good quality, makes sense, logical order, etc. But we have 25%, which is going to, do you demonstrate a strong knowledge of these theories, how to use it, uh, and especially that correct implementation. That's something that people often overlook. Um, and it's good to be doing that with each vector in turn as you explore it in a paragraph. Uh, support. Are your opinions or ideas expressed well substantiated with numerous explicit references to the content and our personal references. So refer to specific parts of the movie. Refer to specific uh, incidents or anecdotes in your own experience. Refer to specific things mentioned in the literature, whether you're talking about the course textbook or, say, an outside article that you have brought in. Okay. Now, a very helpful feature of this assignment is that in addition to the general rubric, there's also a detailed grading guide that goes into more detail about what the difference is between getting full credit and what will get you some credit. And so if you look through this, you'll see that some of that is, have you done the things that are asked? And some of it is, okay, how well have you backed this up? How well have you explained or shown that? So when we were looking at the second column, the partial credit, we see, okay, opinions or ideas expressed are substantiated with references to the content and or personal references. The references cited may or may not express the opinions or positions expressed. And so this is a uh, good prompt for looking at other literature. Because if you're just citing the course textbook, which is more generalized, uh, it may be harder to find something that's backing up the specific point that you're trying to make, especially if you're trying to back up an anecdote with the literature. And so we will look at how you might be doing a search for uh, different sources in a few minutes. So speaking of sources, this has a couple things that we need to be citing. So the basic APA reference entry has four pieces of information. Who wrote it? When was it published? What it's called? And how do you find it? Now, in you have the quick reference guide that will show you different examples of common things. But if we're talking a film specifically, APA 7th edition in a change from previous editions, but APA 7th edition, give us the director name, the little note saying that that's the director, uh, the year that it was released, the title, there's note in square brackets saying it's a film, and then the production companies. Now, often with films, there are multiple production companies. You can see back in 1939, there were two there, and that's the case with Finding Nemo here. Now, if you're looking specifically for the detailed breakdown, you can find an example of this and explanations on the APA style website linked here. And you'll see these guidelines here, including the notation for marking the director. And if you have multiple uh, production companies, how to separate that. So for this one, for Finding Nemo, our reference entry will look like this. Note that Finding Nemo, because Nemo is a proper noun, the name of one of the characters, that's capitalized. We have both Walt Disney Pictures and Pixar Animation Studios listed. If you're going to cite this, 
Stanton and Unkrich are listed as your authors. 2003 is the release date, so it's our publication date. Uh, but if you're referring to the film by name, okay, you can certainly ref list the film in the body of the sentence and then just have your parenthetical citation. Now, uh, if you are referring to a particular moment in the movie, you can include the timestamp in the format hour, colon, minute, colon, and second. So in this case, the citation says, oh, in uh, Stanton and Ungridge 2003, which is the movie Finding Nemo, you know by checking the references, uh, the scene being referred to is 12 minutes, 42 seconds, through 13 minutes, 22 seconds in the film. Okay. And if it was referring to something past the one hour mark, you'd have one colon and then the rest of the stuff. Now, there's the Chicken and Ricer textbook, which is a great resource. But if you haven't read that directly, if you only know it through the, um, through the lens of the course textbook, then you want to be citing the source that you actually did read. And so, if that's the case, if you haven't read the original, then you should be citing the Shoe et al. 2017 source, the Student Services ha a Handbook for the Profession, 6th edition. And you'd cite that one as Shoe et al. 2017. Now, if you are citing that as your source, but you are referring specifically to Chirking and Reiser's ideas, there are a couple of different ways you can do that through what we call a secondary citation. One would be to list them in the signal phrase, Chickering and Riser describe blah, 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 and then at the end of sentence, parenthetical citation. So that tells the reader you are reading it through the lens of shoe at all, either as the source you used. Or if you want to be extra clear on that, and perhaps the chronology of things is important for discussing the development of ideas, you might format it this way. Chickering and Riser, 1993, as cited by... And so what that says is, okay, Tricking and Riser, writing in 1993, I didn't read this directly, but I'm reading it through that. So my understanding, it comes through that, through Shu et al. 2017. Okay, we know the source you're referring to. We know when it came out. We also know that you didn't access it directly. Uh, now, that's not always something you want or need to call attention to, but it is something where if you're, say, discussing the intellectual history, well, this idea came after that, then having, okay, this source, which came out in 1968, as cited by blah, this source that came out in 1993, as cited by blah, that helps us follow the progression of events and their connections, even if you haven't read the originals. At this point, we're going to move into outline and drafting. So if you don't have a copy of it already, I strongly recommend grabbing a copy of the APA course paper template to follow along. Now, as we go through this, some basic principles. Make sure you use the assignment instructions to create a working outline. Add any headings specified for the assignment. Make sure you add and answer the questions for each prompt portion. And especially for this one, since it's mentioned a couple times, name and cite the specific vectors that you're being Sorry, name and cite the specific vectors that are being discussed. So, for example, if you're direct, uh, discussing a particular scene, okay, uh, so tell us what events happen there. Uh, timestamp would be great. Illustrate Chickering and Riser's vector, okay. Uh, but, again, if you didn't read that book specifically, if you didn't get it, then make sure you are citing the actual source that you read. And then... You can see that the sentence that mentions the vector has a citation. And then when it's saying, explaining this principle, which is important, you're saying, okay, there's a source that says that that thing is important. Let us turn to the template and look at how we will go from instructions to outline. So here I have a copy of our APA course paper template. And I've just gone ahead and started to put in a little bit of information. You can fill this in with more detailed information later. But the first step is to get the assignment instructions here. So we have a list of things that we need to do. So I'm going to paste directly from the course website the instructions for this assignment. 
And the first thing you'll notice is that the font doesn't quite match, so I'm going to go here and select Match Destination Formatting. So it's now in Times New Roman 12 point font and the other things we need here. Now, if we are looking at this, we have, this is the summary of the movie. Okay, we, we're actually not going to be a, uh, re rewriting that summary. So I can actually take this out. This is just for helping and uh, follow what you're supposed to be doing. Now, the instruction to view the movie. Okay, don't need that. Don't need this either. Um, but this, let's keep that handy. Uh, this note about the group discussion. Let's take that out. Uh, the note that this is recapping something we have other. So we have these instructions here. We'll keep those handy. And this instruction to use the prompts as the outline. Okay, we can take that out. And this is recapping things we had earlier. Uh, this is something I'll take out because it's not as detailed as the one above. And now we have the outline here. Now, because we know that each character needs to be, um, so each of these needs to be discussed with reference to a character, so we know that for these ones, we're going to have to list the character. So to make a uh, to make a easy reference for us to fill in of the things that we need to follow, then go ahead and give yourself a note to add the character for each one. And you know what? It's not going to be just the character. It's going to also the specific scene or moment or actions. And so we know we're going to have to list that for each of them. So might as well track that for each of them as well. Now, as you are reading through this, as you're starting to just develop your outline, you might see something and immediately have an example come to mind. We'll go ahead and put that in now, because then when you are watching the movie, you can go, oh, okay, here's where that scene starts, this minute, the, the second, and here's where it ends, and so then you have that information that you collect to use for your citation. That would be like in this example here, uh, the latter one where it's referring to a scene, it describes it, and then you have the citation for the movie, including the timestamp, so you know exactly when that's referring to. Now, it, this is your starting point. You then want to explain, okay, what exactly went on that matches the development and what are the implications of that? Uh, so there, there we will end up with a substantial uh, paragraph, but it's going to start by, okay, <laughs> which character and which scene or scenes show that thing? So. If we are looking at this, uh, another way to think about it is how does this information connect? Because you could just go through all seven vectors, but if we look at how they map out, if we take the version as expressed in Chickering and Reiser 1993, the one that's mostly discussed in your textbook, we see that there's this grouping here of the pre-identity ones the establishing identity, and then the post-identity. And that's one way that you can give some form, some organization, especially for making sense of how you discuss these in the conclusion. Is this the only way that you might organize the body of the paper? No, but it's one. And if you did decide to do that, here's what I would recommend doing here. So we're going to be using the template headings for APA style headings. So you want to be on the home part of the ribbon and pop out the styles pane here. So that gives you this menu on the side for formatting headings. And so if we look at this, okay, the introduction, that's the start of the paper. We don't really need a uh, heading for that. We shouldn't have one in APA style. But here, uh, okay, well, if this is all le the first four leading towards establishing identity, You can call this heading many things, but 
I like headings that are very clearly descriptive. You can always update them to be more poetic or elegant if you like, but start with accurate and clear. Before identity is established, and then we have when establishing identity. So we apply the AP level one, and you can see that that is going to jump to the center and get bolded. And then we have after identity has been established. Are you required to have these headings? No, but it does help delineate the different sections and see the relative length if you have discussed them in sufficient length and breadth. Uh, because it's easy to fall into a rhythm of, okay, you're just listing this thing and uh, then you move on to the next one without a sense of how do these fit together and then you get to the conclusion and think, oh, well, I need to revisit all of these, so that's going to be seven sentences just in that before I do the uh, some ways that they can be useful, and that would be a very, very long conclusion. So by looking at how these fit together here, it's easier to, to figure out what kinds of things you can discuss here, so it's not all saved up for the conclusion. All right, uh, let's do a quick recap of what we've talked about today. So we began with looking at Chickering and Reister's Seven Vectors of Identity Development. This is the form laid out in their 1993 update of Chickering's original book, Education and Identity. We looked specifically at this assignment for the Higher Education 613 course, the Week 3 Assignment 4, I Spy the Vectors. We talked about how to reference and cite key sources needed for this assignment. We looked at how to take the assignment instructions and begin the process of outlining and drafting. And the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to take a look at how to find additional sources in case you want something more specific to supplement what you have already. So we're going to head over to the ACU Libraries Distance Education Portal. Now, if you do a search in the in your search engine of choice for acu.edu distance education portal, you'll get this first result, which brings us to the portal itself that we're talking about. Now, this has a kind of more curated, more directed and, uh, approach to searching the library catalog. And so some students find that it is a little easier because there are fewer options to consider. And they can focus better on the task at hand. Now, the uh, assignment instructions did say if you bring in other resources, they should be scholarly articles. So we'll click peer reviewed here. And let's just search for Chickering and Riser. You don't actually need the word and, that'll be screened out. But if we search for that, those two names, let's see what comes up here. Now, there'll be a lot of uh, results here because this is you know, one of those seminal pieces of literature that people cite and refer to over and over again. Now, one of the first things that you'll notice here is that we have 2,650 results. That's a lot, and for this paper, far more than you want to be going through. So let's make sure that this information is as pertinent as possible. So first of all, I'm going to say I want to look at more recent literature. And a good commonly accepted definition is the last five years. So let's move to 2017 to 2022, and we have about 500 results. Great. And I only want to look at ones where I can read it all right now, so full text. See if that changes anything. Uh, not a whole lot. We still have 482. This is great. Now, now we come to the, the question of what exactly your interest is here. And so there's a lot of room to pick a source based on your personal research interests. So we have, for example, here, the second result that says looking at students with learning disabilities tr transitioning from college. Uh, there are some things in Finding Nemo and its uh, sequel, Finding Dory, that you might make a connection there. Uh, writing instruction, a uh, particular group, uh, doctoral level. <laughs> so if you have a particular interest in 
one of these directions, you can add that to your search terms and uh, make this more specific. But uh, let's say that we are looking for something that cites a specific article. Uh, and let's say we, we want to first look, see the original. Well, tricking and, and Ricer, that's a book. So we're probably not going to find it here. So I'd like to show you a different uh, way. So if we search for education and identity here, so we're leaving aside the previous search. We're doing a new search for the title Education and Identity. And then we'll have to get rid of some of these things. So drop peer-reviewed journals. We're going to go ahead and, and drop full text because usually you don't have a book like that online. Some newer stuff you might have as ebooks, but usually not something from the 1990s. Okay, so here's this book here. So we we'll go ahead and open up this entry here. And we see that uh, we have some subject headings that we could use to look for similar things. But looking at this, we see the titles of the different chapters here. So if you were reading through it through the course text and said, you know, this, uh, I really want more on developing integrity. Well, we've got a whole chapter on that here that you could go look at. All right, next resource here. Uh, we see this find similar results. So this is a little option on the side. So if we click on that, then we will have a set of suggestions for things that the catalog thinks is similar, many of which will be more up to date. So if we look, say, for last five years here, let's see what comes up. So here we have relationship rich education, how communi even communicate, sorry, relationship rich education, how human connections drive success in college. So this is very much of interest to me. Uh, if I was writing this paper, I would be looking at that. But we can actually go one step further on this. So I'm going to now show you Google Scholar. So Google Scholar is very simply scholar.google.com. And here we're going to search for Chickering and Ricer. You can search for the seven vectors. Let's see what comes up. So here's an article by Ricer writing two years after the book with some information about it. And this one here is uh, an article explaining this. Here we have a longitudinal study, uh, so study conducted over an extended period of time looking at how these apply. So if we're looking at the conclusion, you know, how does this matter? Looking at this article, that would be a really strong contender. So also here, this is the book. This is Education and Identity Second Edition here. So you can see this cited by. So if you're looking for something that's related to, a good clue is, did they cite the thing that your starting interest is in? So here, if we select cited by, then we see we have 6,000 results and we can say, look at, all right, we want to see more recent stuff last four or five years. And we have a large component of things here. Now, there's even a way you can link this into your ACU library catalog to search things in ACU. But the point here is to identify something that looks like it might be A, of interest to you, and B, directly relevant to understanding the implications of the seven vectors. So if you see something here, we can go search in the ACU catalog uh, and even follow these cited by links to see, okay, well, if this is a particular thing you're interested in how loneliness affects that and you know could definitely make an argument about loneliness as a factor in finding Nemo uh, then go ahead and hit cited by and see what uses this you want to make sure that it still connects directly to the seven vectors but you could add that to your search terms up here so with that let us bring things to a close here so we went through Chickering and Reiser's seven vectors of identity development 
looked at how they manifest in this assignment, talked about how to cite the key sources to write about it, how to find additional information. And that, as they say, is a wrap. If you have any questions, please feel free to send us an email at onlinewritingcenter.acu.edu or sign up for an appointment, give us any special questions or requests in the feedback, in the appointment notes. And with that, have a good night.